so today we're going to be talking about inheritance, polymorphism, and recursion. So this is just like, I don't know. Or well, like, it's a little more, I hope you all reviewed because we're, we're more advanced than the, the basics. So inheritance is one of the really useful features of like Java programming. So like, it's really similar to inheritance, like if you were to use it in like actual like English or something. So if someone comes into like an inheritance, it means that their relative is just giving them something and like as a child, you inherit it, right? So in Java, all classes can inherit attributes, which are instance variables and behaviors, which are like methods or what a class can do from another class. So the class being inherited from is called the parent class, like just like in how you would use it normally, the parent class gives something to the child class or the subclass. So the parent class is the one that is being inherited from. It's also called the super class. And then the class that is inheriting is the child class or the subclass. So um, when one class inherits from another, we say that it is the same kind of thing as the parent class, so the class it inherits from. So it sounds kind of weird, but like here you have like a um, car, I believe. Okay, inherits from a vehicle, and then a motorcycle is a type of vehicle, so it also inherits from vehicle. So why would you use inheritance? So inheritance is this like concept of reusability. So when you want to create a new class and there's already a class that includes some of the code that we want, we can take our new class from the existing class. And by doing this, we're reusing the methods of the existing class. And also allows you to reuse like, so it basically just gives you the data and the behavior from the parent class. And if you notice that a lot of classes share the same data or like behavior methods and variables, then you can pull that out into a parent class. And this is what's called generalization. So for example, down here, customers and employees are both people. So it makes sense to use the general person class as seen below. So customers and employees both have a name and address and therefore can inherit from the person class. And you only use inheritance when the child class is really a type of the parent class. So if you aren't sure if a class should inherit from another class, you just ask yourself, can you substitute the subclass type for the superclass type? And in this case, you just ask, is a customer a person? And well, yeah, so, and is an employee a person? And yeah, that's also true. So you could use inheritance on the customer class and the employee class and inherit from the parent class. So like something that wouldn't work would be like books and authors. While there might, they might be related and books, have authors, but authors aren't a kind of book, and books also aren't a kind of author. So the book has an author attribute, but you can't say that. So like you can't say that an author is a book, therefore you wouldn't use inheritance here. So inheritance is also useful for specialization, which is when you want most of the behavior of a parent class, but want it to do one thing differently or add more data. And this example below can also be seen as specialization. An employee is a person, but also has a unique ID. And a customer is also like a person, but has a credit card information, which is unique to the customer. So how do we use inheritance? Um, inheritance is like, so when you want to use inherit, when you want to like make a subclass inherit from a superclass or child inherit from the parent class, and you use the Java keyword, which is extend with the superclass name when creating a new subclass. So the format would be like your class and then the name of your child subclass or ch child class subclass means the same thing. And then extends, the keyword extends, and then the superclass, which is just vehicle, which is the parent class or the class that's being inherited from. So in this case, public class car, this is the child class, extends from vehicle, which is the parent class or super class. 
same thing, motorcycle is a new cost being created that will inherit from the vehicle, which is the parent cost. So um, when, okay, when subclasses are, when you do this, this means that the subclass, the new class will inherit public methods from the superclass that they extend and the instance variables. So um, this is basically the same thing, but instead we're using the customer extends person and person is our go going to be our superclass, which has the name instance variable and a constructor for person. However, okay, um, the subclass that is created does not inherit constructors from the superclass. And the subclass also cannot access the private instance variables of the superclass directly. So they can't like just use the dot format and get the name and they must use the public accessor method. So um, that just means getters and setters, but the, okay, here. And then, so here, how do we initialize the superclasses private variables if you don't have access to them in the subclass? So um, the superclass constructor can be called from the first line of a subclass constructor by using the special keyword super, which is this, and passing appropriate parameters. So like if your if the if the uh, constructor in the parent class has like string the name, which means you have to pass in a string in order to um, set the name, then you have to follow the um, you have to follow however it's written in the parent one. So this becomes public customer, and then you have to write string the name and then super, and then you also have to pass in the parameter. So basically the super, the name and the employee con constructor will call the constructor that takes a string object in the person class to set the name. And that's basically how it works. So here it's just the same thing. Um, you have your person class. This time it has your get getters um, getter method that returns the name. And then here you have your public class for employee that also inherits from person. And this one includes the ID. And then this one is going to set the ID. And this one isn't really much to do with inheritance, but like it just sets an ID for the employee and then it'll increase by one every time so that no employee has the same ID. So then you have your get ID for the employee, which is specific to the employee class because, well, person class doesn't really have an ID, but employee does. So we can see an example of this. Oh, okay, here we have employee and then we'll try and run this. So, oh, oops, okay. So we have our employee class and this is basically the same thing that we just looked at, except this time it has a main method that will create an employee object and we'll just name her Danny. And then we're going to use this get name method and the get ID method. So because it is inheritance and like the employee does extend from person. So employee inherits all the methods of person and person happens to have this method called get name. So because it inherits the methods, that means employee can use the method get name, even though it's not directly in the employee class. And obviously it can use get ID because the method is written in its class. So if we run this, then it does, Okay, it works. And okay, wrong one. But if you ignore whatever was just called, this will um, this will print the employee name get name, even though it's the method isn't in the customer. Uh, the method isn't in the employee class, and it also prints the ID, 
which is just one. And this will work if you add more employee objects or if you change the name, whatever, it still works. Okay, moving on. Now we have, um, now we'll try this. So given the class definitions of endpoint and named point below, which is the constructors that follow labeled one, two, and three, which are these, would be valid in the named point class. So name point inherits from endpoint. And basically name point is the same thing as endpoint, just like it has an extra instance variable that's for the name. And, and these are the three constructors that are possibility. And now we have to determine which of these work. So first class endpoint, we have the private instance variables, the X and Y integers, and then you have a constructor that takes no arguments. So it just sets, this is like the default, it sets it to zero and zero. And then one that takes two parameters, two integers that set X to A and then Y to B. So now you have the, the class that inherits from endpoint called name point. And now you have to come up with some constructors. So let's look at the first one, public name point, and then it just says my name is equal to an empty string. So does anyone think this will work? Any thoughts? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, good job. It does work. And the reason this is, is because it doesn't try to access the private variables that are in endpoint and it only uses, or like it only accesses the ones that are already defined here in its class. So this does work. Now let's move on to the second constructor, public name point, and then it passes in an integer, an integer, and then a, name, a string name. Then it tries to set my X to D1, my Y to D2, and then my name to name. Will this one work? Any thoughts? Okay, well, this one actually won't work. And this is because the children class don't have direct access to private fields. And because of this, you can't just access my X or my Y and you will have an error. So the way to fix this is by using the super call, which is basically just calling the constructor that takes the whatever is passed in, which is leads us to part three. So instead of just directly setting my X and my Y to D1 and D2, we use the super constructor or super to call the parent constructor, which is this one. And we basically just use the two integers that we passed in, and then we use it in the constructor here to set my X and my Y to D1 and D2 respectively, and set the variables here. And then my name equals name, that works because, well, it's already declared in the class itself. So the correct answers will be one and three. Now we're going to try to make a class square inherit from rectangle. And um, our first step is to make a class square inherit from rectangle. And this is our class rectangle. First, we have some private uh, variables, including length, width, and area. OK, actually, just ignore area, but length and width. And then we have our constructor for length and width. And then we have a constructor with two arguments, which sets length to an integer L and width to an integer W. So then it asks us to add a square um, to inherit from rectangle, a no argument constructor that calls rectangles constructor with super, and then add a square constructor with one argument for a side that calls rectangles constructor with two arguments using super as well. And then it tells us to test drawing the squares. So again, I will use this. Um, this is basically the same thing. 
we have our constructor with zero arguments, our constructor with two arguments, and then a draw method, which basically just loops through like the length and the width and then prints an asterisk for everyone. So that like it draws a start, uh, it draws the shape with asterisk. So, and then we have our public class square and then our main method that will allow us to draw our shapes when we're done. So right now, the other ones are commented out and right now we're only going to be testing the rectangle which we've set as three comma five. And we'll just draw it and yeah, we already know that this will work. It's just three by five. So now how do we make a class square that can, uh, that can make a square instead? So first things first, it asks us to make the square class inherit from rectangle class. And how do we do that? Does anyone have any ideas? So how we do this is basically with the keyword extends. And as we talked about earlier, the formatting is basically you use your class, the subclass, which will be square. Then we use the word extends. And then we use the superclass or the parent class, which is going to be rectangle. And it, there's no errors, so it worked. And now we're going to add a square no argument constructor that calls rectangles constructor using super. So now I have to write a constructor. So our, struct, our constructor for square will be public. And then it will be square because that's the title of our class. And then from in here, we'll just write super. Okay. And that's basically um, just our square constructor following this one. We're going to be making it, making the length and the width both equal to one. And it should work. And this one is. This one is just the same. And then we can try and run this one, which is basically our square now. And the constructor makes a square shape. And yeah, that's our square. It's just one by one. So it doesn't really look like anything, but yeah. So now we're going to make our next shape which we want to be able to pass in just one argument. And then we want to call the rectangles constructor, which takes two arguments. So how do we do that? First, we write our title, which will be public square. And then we want to pass in only one parameter. And this will be an integer L because, well, as we know, squares have like, okay, squares and rectangles, the length and the width of a square is just the same. And then if we only pass in one integer for the length, then we can use this integer as the same as the value for both the L and the W because they don't have to be different when we pass them into the rectangle constructor. So basically what we do now is we just pass in L twice or for both the first value and the second value. Since it's an integer, it doesn't really, like they're both, it's an integer and this one requires two integer inputs. And this is what we pass in to call the parent constructor, which is here. Now we just run this to draw our square with a length of three which will set both our length and our width as three and then make it possible for it to be drawn. So now we just draw this and it should be a three by three square, which it is. Any questions? Okay, guess not, we'll move on then. So another thing is an inheritance hierarchy. 
So if you have multiple subclasses that inherit from a superclass, you can form what's called an inheritance hierarchy. And where every subclass is a, or is a kind of the superclass. So for example, here's an inheritance hierarchy of shapes. So a square here is, is a rectangle or is a type either way. And then a subclass of rectangle. And then rectangle is a shape or is a type of shape and therefore will be a subclass of shape. And then here, same thing, a circle is a or is a type of ellipse, and an ellipse is a or is a type of shape. Triangle is a type of shape, and yeah, that's basically how it works. So um, one of the main reasons to use an inheritance hierarchy is that the instance variables and methods from a superclass are inherited and can be used in a subclass without rewriting or copying code. So basically it just, saves time and like kind of can make your program neater in a way. And then another example of this, like if you wanted to do something like vehicles, like we talked about earlier, then you could split this into like vehicles and then maybe like fueled versus not fueled. And then on the fueled side, you could split into like cars and motorcycles and then non-fueled would be like bikes or scooters or whatever. So it's just like an inheritance hierarchy is basically just like a tree of inheritance. Like this, I don't know, kind of reminds me of like a family tree. I don't know. It's, yeah. So then we'll talk about polymorphism, which is often used alongside inheritance. And basically it's just when um, like, a method that gets called depends on the type of object that it is at runtime. So you'll just get different outputs depending on what your object is. And poly just means many, morphism means form. So it's just many forms and that's basically what it is. So there's two main ways of this. And one of them is overloading methods. And then overloaded methods are basically just methods with the same name signature. So name signature just is like the same name, like it's called the same thing. Like for here, for example, add, add and add, they're all the same. Like if you were to call this, it'd be object dot add and it'd all be the same. Like this way you call them is the same, but the parameters of them are different. So this is kind of similar to like um, overloaded constructors which I believe you've learned about before, it's basically when a class has more than one constructor, but the parameters are different. So either the parameter, like the number of parameters could be different, the types of parameters like int, double, or like string could be different, or the sequence of the data types of parameters are different. So for example, like int x, double y versus double x, and then int y, like that could be different as well. And it just, the, like what happens changes depending on what you put as your parameters. Um, that's basically it. And then you have overriding inherited methods. And overriding an inherited method just means like providing a public method in a subclass with the same method signature as a public method in the superclass. So basically your child class has the same, like has a method that's written the same as a method in the parent class. So a method signature is basically like the method name, the parameter types and the return types. So it will basically look kind of the same. And when this happens, the method in the subclass is called instead of the method in the superclass. So the child class is called first or like the program looks through your child class to see if that method exists first and if it doesn't then it looks in the parent class so um an example of this would be this this class so we have a public class pet and or called pet and then it has a name a type then your constructor string name string type and it'll just set the name in the type 
you have your getter methods, and then you have a speak method, which if you have a pet object and then you call it to speak, it will automatically print out this skirt. Okay. Then you have a dog, um, a dog class that inherits from the pet class. Um, same thing. It also has, okay, here it first has its constructor, which uses super, or it passes in the string name, which will set the name as name, and then the dog, I mean, the type as dog, the string type dog automatically, because like dog is like a specific pet. And you already know the type, so they just set the type as dog. So this super constructor just calls the parent constructor and then sets the name as whatever you pass in as the name and then the type as dog. Then it has a speak method, and this is what overriding is. So as you can see, the uh, method signature is the same. Like this is called, it's called the same thing. It's called speak. The parameters are the same, which is none. And then the return type, which is void, is also the same. So if you were to have a dog object and you were to tell, like you were to have the object dot speak, then it print out woof instead of gur. So um, yeah, that's just overwriting. We'll check the like specific class first before checking the parent class for the method. Same thing with the cat. It has its um, constructor that calls super name, and then instead of dog, it has cat. And then you have your public, um, no, then you have your speak method. And this time, if you were to have a cat object, and if you were to call it to speak, then it'd print out meow instead. So like if this dog method did not have a speak method, then this would, and if you were to call it to speak, since it does inherit the parent class methods and this um, speak call would print out the, this, whatever this prints out instead, because if the child class does not have the method, then it checks the parent class and then it prints out whatever the parent class will um, ask you to do. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for overwriting. And now we can try this. So what will be returned if we run this program? And this basically just creates a public class greeter, which says, which says that um, the greet will print out hi if a greeter object is called to greet. And here's our public, our main method. We first create an object, G1 as a greeter and we call like we print out what g1.greet is and then we have our second class mean greeter that inherits from the greeter method and instead our greet method for mean greeter says go away so if we have a g1 which is the greeter the parent method and g2 which is our subclass the mean greeter and we print out both of their greet methods, what will it say? Any ideas? Okay, guess not, but G1, new greeter. Okay, never mind. Okay. Um, how about, how about JC, any ideas? Okay, um, so we'll just follow this, g1.greet. And since it is a greet object, we'll look in this class and it just returns high. So the first system, the outprint statement We'll print out hi and then the second one is asking for g2 and g2 is a mean greeter so we'll go check that class first and it says and it does happen to have a greet method so and in that it says it returns go away so what it will print is hi for the first one and go away for the second one 
Okay, now we'll just move on and hold um, a short lesson on polymorphism. Now we'll move on to recursion. So recursion is basically when a method calls on itself. So in this method, it says public static void never end and the system, and in this loop, it prints out system.out.print and then a line that says, this is the method that never ends. And then after that is called, it gets called on again. So it just calls itself in its like, um, in its like writing or in its method. So it calls itself and we can see what happens when we call this method. Now we have recursion, same thing. Um, what happens when we call this method? And as you can see, it is a method that never ends. And it basically just the program overflows and it just dies, as you can see here. So probably not a good idea to have an infinite method or infinite recursion. So you basic, um, but this isn't how you would normally write recursion. Normally you'd have like a place where the recursion stops, which we'll talk about in a second. So you basically use recursion when it's used, um, used to solve problems where the structure of the problem repeats. So for example, like if you wanted to find out like how much space a folder in your computer like uses, then you have to add up like all the sizes of the files in the folder. But inside of those folders, you might also have like more subfolders and then you have to repeat the procedure for each subfolder. So that procedure in this case would be like a method for Java. And um, that would be like a situation where you would need to repeat something over and over. But in our case in Java, Recursion can be used to like traverse string array and array list uh, objects, much like a loop. So a recursion solution, like where you repeat them, where you call the method in itself can also be written in loops. Like the, uh, in fact, every single recursion solution can also be written in loops. So for a recursion to be useful, you most, most of the time, like you want to have a place where the loop like stops so it's not infinite and it doesn't crash your program. And that's, that's what's called a base case. The base case stops recursion and um, we'll use an example, factorial. So for those of you who don't know what factorial is, factorial is when you do like exclamation mark next to something and it's just the product of the first whatever uh, positive integer. So like five factorial would be five times four all the way down to one. And that is equal to 120. So to write a factorial method, we have to have our base case first when it stops. And then we have to have like when it calls itself. So here's our recursive call. So um, in our factorial method, we um, pass in an integer n, which will be like, in this case, it's going to be five. And um, when n reaches zero, then we're going to return one, or else we're going to return the um, value that we're on times factorial n minus one, which will be um, the recursive call, which means we're going to go back and find out what factorial n minus one is, all the way down until we get we reach like factorial zero, which will return one, and then it'll kind of go back and like multiply what factorial one was, factorial two, all the way back to n. So um, if we look at this more closely, so if we call factorial five, it returns n, which is five times factorial n minus one, which is going to be four. So factorial four, and then to find out what this is, we have to go find out what factorial four is. And then to find out factorial four, 
we go through this again, factorial four is four equal to zero, no, else, then return four times factorial four minus one, which is three. So then we have to do this all the way until we reach factorial zero. So factorial four is equal to four times factorial three, and then down three times factorial two, and so on, right? All the way down to factorial zero equals one. So now that we know what factorial zero is, we can kind of work our way back up and factorial one is just equal to one times one, then factorial one we know is one. So two times factorial one is one, is two times one equals two. And then, yeah, basically we work our way back up. Three times two equals six, four times six is equal to 24, and then five times 24 is equal to 120. And like we did that, uh, like what we did earlier, which we found that five factorial is equal to 120. This program also tells us that five factorial or factorial five is equal to 120. And that's basically how recursion works. You just call um, your own, like you call the method in itself so that it loops until you find what you're looking for. Any questions on this? Okay, um, okay, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions. Now um, we'll try this one. Let's just try and figure out what this uh, mystery method does. So um, first of all, we know that this is recursion, first of all, because it calls here mystery. Uh, it calls, okay, um, it calls the method in self. And, and it has an if and else statement where if n equals zero, then you return one. So this is our base case and this is our recursive call. So let's just test out like what this returns first. So if we were to put five as our integer n, then first we go through this loop, it's not equal to zero, and then we return two times mystery n minus one which is two times mystery four. And this just goes um, like the same thing we did last time where we just uh, work our way down and then find out what's down here. And then we like kind of like go back up and fill in like what we were missing before. So this just becomes two times mystery four and then mystery four is equal to two times mystery three and so on. So pretty self-explanatory on how you find out what it returns. But now we have to figure out what it does. Now we know that mystery five is equal to 32. So what does it do? Um, if we take a look at this, basically every time like n, go, like every time we go through this loop, we re get returned to two and our final product is multiplied by two and then um, n, or what we enter at first, gets decreased by one. And then n um, decreases by one all the way down to zero. And then when it reaches zero, we get returned a one. And this is two times however many, we, like we're not sure yet, until we reach zero. So basically what this is doing is um, for every n, for every n all the way down to zero, we multiply our um, value by two. And we know that our last value is one. So this will basically, this basically um, is doing like, how many times, how many twos do we multiply for this number? And every time we multiply it by two, then we take one away. And this is, so this mystery method is basically just um, like, it's just two to the power of what? And two to the power of, two to the power of five is equal to 32. So um, that's basically what our mystery does. If we take a look every time n decreases, then two gets multiplied by one. So it's basically two to the power of n. 
And now we can try to write a recursive um, method. So first of all, okay, our goal here is to write a method so that our, okay, we, we want to write a method that will reverse whatever we put in. So I want to, um, it'll be like reverse and then I'll insert a text here and then we'll like using this recursive method, we're going to find out how, like what it is in reverse. So how do we make this work? Say I have a word that's like four letters, it's word, and I want to change it to D-R-O-W, right? Okay, and then how we're going to do this is by every time we like go through the um, function, I want to take the first character and then move it to the end. And then this will be like our function for now. And then I want to take what's left of the string and then do the same thing. So this, I want to take what's left and then move our first character again and then behind the second words or behind like what we just took out of the string. And basically I want to keep doing on doing this, doing this until like we're left with um, no words. So it will be like this and then our, this is our last like original string. And then I'll take this and move it to the end, which is nothing left. Well, there's kind of nothing left. So then if we were to add this up, then it'd be the reverse of the word. So how do we do this? We've already figured out that our base case is going to be when the text or the string is equal to zero. So my text dot length is equal to zero. And that's when we will return an empty string so that, okay, that's when I'll return an empty string so that like we don't go on forever, like it's not infinite. And then here I'll write the else statement, which will be the recursive call. And then we will return, we first want to, as we said earlier, we want to first take the first, or we'll do the rest of the word first, or we'll call the um, statement, or we'll call the method on the rest of the word. And then we'll move the um, first letter of the word to the end of the word so that, like, so this will be separate until the, um, method finish it, finishes doing the reverse method on the rest of the word for each time. So if we work on ORD while we ignore the W and then O is our first letter of the new substring and also gets moved to the back and basically all the way until this substring is just nothing. So we return the reverse of whatever is left this, um, besides the like the first letter, so it'll be substring, and then you'll have a one because that is everything um, past. That's everything in the string besides the first letter. So then this will be plus my text dot character at, and this will be the first letter of your um, word. And then this should work. Now we'll go test it out on our IDE. And this is basically the same thing that I just wrote. And then we'll test it. We can use the word word or actually we can change it to something longer. And it will work. Okay, I'm not sure why this one printed, but this is what prints after you run this method, this recursive call. Any questions? Uh, 
Okay, guess not. One. So now we'll try, actually, now we're going to run through this recursion. So we're going to try and figure out what this mystery method does again. Um, if you guys would like to try walking through this method with me, that'd be great. So um, here's our mystery method. It takes two parameters this time, uh, two integers. And if b is equal to zero, it returns one, else it will multiply a times the mystery a, and then like the recursive call a, and then b minus one. So the first thing we want to do, if we want to figure out what it does, like we'll just test out, test it out with some smaller values just to see what's going on. So if we do mystery two comma three, three is not equal to zero. So we'll skip the if part and we'll move on to else. Return a is at a, which is two, and then times the mystery, which is a again, which is two, and then b minus one, which is going to be two. And now we have to go through again, mystery two comma two is going to be equal to two times mystery, and then a doesn't change, and then b decreases, and it's going to be one. Mystery two comma one will be equal to two times mystery, and then we'll finally reach two comma zero. Now, now that our b value is equal to zero, we know that our, our it returns it returns one. And now that we know what mystery two comma zero is, we can just plug this in for the rest of the values. So this becomes two times one, this becomes two times whatever this was, which was two, and then four, and then um, two times four, which would be equal to eight. Now we find out that the mystery two comma three is equal to eight. Now, what this is basically doing is every time we run through this, our a stays the same, our a never changes, but the b decreases by one. And every time we go through this, we multiply a by itself one more time. And one um, all the way until b is nothing. So basically what this is doing is multiplying a by itself b many times. So this is basically exponent. So exponent, and then a is going to be our base number, and then b is going to be our power. So basically what this is doing is a to the power of b, if we look at this closely. And that's kind of what recursion is useful for. Um, that's kind of what we covered today. So, what we learned today was inheritance um, is when one class can inherit objects or instance variables and methods from another, and this makes it easy to reuse another class by extending it or inheriting from it, um, the, which is called specialization. And you can also pull out common instance variables or methods from several related classes and put them in a common parent class, which is called generalization. Um, the parent class is the one being inherited from, also called superclass. A child class is the one that's inheriting, and it's also called the subclass. Polymorphism is a method that gets called when the code um, is run, depends on the type. Okay, this is when a method. But um, so it just depends on the type of object. And um, if the method isn't found in the class that creates the object and it's going to keep looking in the parent class and like keep looking up at the inheritance tree until it finds the method. And well, um, yeah. And then overloading is when at least two methods with the same name, but have different parameter lists. And then the parameter lists differ by the number of parameters or the types 
um, override is when a child class can have the same method signature, which is the method name and parameter list as a parent class. And then when the program is run, it will look for the method in the child class before it looks for the method in the parent class. Um, extend is the keyword that is used to specify the parent class to inherit from. So the formatting of this would be like um, public class, the child's name, the, the class, the subclass, and then extends, and then the parent name or the parent class or the super class. Super is the keyword used to call a method in a parent class. And this is useful if a child class like overrides an inherited method, but still wants to call it. And this is also just used to like, um, for the constructors to call the parent class, uh, the parent constructors. Um, okay. Now uh, I'll go over this homework. So uh, to just review the context, because I believe they're doing a project and you can use these, whatever you learn today in it. And then we have a sh shopping programming challenge, which I'll find right now. So basically it's a, it's kind of like, all right, I'll show you. But this is basically the, um, file on Replit, you can use this and then download as a zip file to try this on your own. Basically, it tells you what to do. This is just the main class that you run to use the other things. So the item class is already written for you and the shopping cart class is um, pretty much done. And basically what you'll be working on if you choose to do this, will be the discounted item. And everything that you need to do is kind of listed here already. And if you would like to take a look, I'll invite you all. But um, yeah, if you would like to take a look, I'll paste it in the chat. Um, to do it in your own ID, again, just download it as a zip file and then open it in your own ID. But yeah, um, any questions? Okay, if there aren't any questions, I guess you can like just try this. Um, okay, here it'll ask us to add an instance variable for the discount. And basically we already know that discounted item is inheriting from item and um, yeah, so this basically just becomes, we want to create an instance variable for the discount. So this becomes private, double discount. Actually, I have this on, okay, never mind. So, and then we have to add constructors that call the super constructor. So like we did earlier, we are going to do public. And then we'll pass in our parameters, which will be the name, the price, and then our discount, which we just um, defined here. I mean, for our new um, item. So this will become, since we can take a look at the item and it has this one, that this constructor that we want to use, because we want to pass in three parameters. So this is the one that we're going to want to use because we want to have a name and a price and then also a discount. So to do this, 
we just did super and then the name and the price which we passed in already. So this will be super name comma price. And then the second part, since discount is already defined here, we'll just do discount equals and then what we passed in, which will be discount. And then it asks us to write getter setter methods for discount. And we kind of, well, it kind of does it here, but um, instead of 0 0.0, 0, we'll place 0, 0 0.0 with discount. And then here it asks us to add a two string method that returns a call to the super to string. And um, this is basically, it asks us to call this one. And this is, super can also be used to call parent methods. That's, so to do this one, you do like return or public string to string. and return super, but then you do dot two string. So this will basically go look for the two string method in the um, parent class, which is item. And then, it, and then the discount in parentheses using the super dot value two string method. So this also, you're also going to call the parent method or the uh, method from the parent class value to string. So basically just this plus super super dot value to string. And then instead of value, you'll do discount. And yeah, there's a little more to do to this, but that's basically it. Um, you guys should go try this on your own to get a better understanding of inheritance. And yeah, I think that's it for today. Um, um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Hope you had a good time. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me.